Ah, yes, someone wants to know about the real Miss Havisham. The real Miss Havisham? Um, well, Charles Dickens had a son. I know his nickname, but not his real name. He was known in the, in the family as Plorn, but <laughs> a weird nickname. But uh, what his real name was, I couldn't tell you. He, uh, he came to Australia and he used to write home to his father bits and pieces of colonial um, uh, gossip and so on that his father might, uh, might like. And uh, uh, he... Um, himself he became a, a member of New South Wales Parliament. He must have had a certain amount of uh, ginger in his nature because one day there was a fellow going on at great length and uh, uh, he rose in his place and said, Mr Speak, and the man who was going on was called Willis. And, uh, and young Dickens stood up and said, Mr Speaker, Willis is barking. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, Dickens, as far as I know, that's the only detail that uh, the young man sent to his father, which his father put into a novel, the one about Miss Donnithorne. She was a woman of, who lived in uh, respectable upper-class uh, Newtown in those days and uh, apparently sat before her, um, uh, her ruined wedding fair feast for the rest of her life and was buried in the St Stephen's churchyard up there. Beyond that, I don't know too much, but that, that's the outline of the story. <laughs> Um, got most of that. Yeah, he liked your um, the thing you wrote about the sentimental bloke. Oh, yeah. Uh, interested in, in to what extent are people overseas limited in their appreciation of Australia, is that right? Um, I think one of the troubles is that um, Australia is not dramatic enough. It's not, there's not enough blood in it. Uh, and there's been efforts to infuse blood into it because nothing like blood to bring, the, to, to bring spirits, you know, as the Greeks knew in their drama. And... Uh, pour out the blood and the, and the dead and all the other spirits come to drink. And uh, there's been a certain amount of blood in Australia and it's been emphasised enormously, but uh, I think that's the trouble. The, the, it's the old problem of how the hell do you talk about peace? How do you celebrate peace? Because people find it boring. They uh, hate to admit it, but they do. They find it boring. I don't. I write about peace a lot, but uh, you've got to find ways of uh, conveying it Without uh, w w without boredom, and uh, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a trick, I tell you. you know? uh, we've been very fortunate in Australia in not having too much, uh, at least internal, um, blood and violence. I mean, an Aboriginal person might say otherwise, but uh, uh, and I think one of the troubles we have of uh, running off to other people's wars is because we're looking for the uh, you know the, the, that. That uh, very special juice, as, uh, uh, as Goethe called it, blood. Um, yeah, you talk about B. Miles in one of your poems, and you say Australia would be better off if we had more people like her. Can you talk a bit about There was that? a time when we valued um, um, eccentrics. Uh, sometimes they are tragic eccentrics too, and uh, um, some of the stories were really quite grim, but um, she was not especially grim, I don't think. Her father apparently was a... Uh, a great magnate of Sydney, and she opposed him politically at, at every point, and uh, went went on the streets more or less to to show her utter opposition. Um, and I remember her, you know, around the place. I had a couple of good yarns with her over the years. Uh, a formidable lady who would uh, would step into your car and commandeer a, a lift to a North Ride or a, a St South Stain or somewhere, you know. <laughs> Pretty help you if you didn't obey, but if you did obey, she was very urbane and would talk to you. And uh, uh, taxi drivers occasionally had the doors ripped off their taxis. She was a woman of some strength. Uh, um, they uh, they went in fear of her. Although there was a private contract she made with one fellow to take her to Melbourne on the basis. So what was the, the arrangement was um, no unwanted advances, no uh, no speeds over fifty miles an hour. And uh, I went down to Melbourne, they had a great time apparently, and came back. And then later she went to Perth on the same arrangement. But, uh, <laughs> I think Australia was better off for, uh, for people like that. We haven't valued the individual very much lately. Uh, we usually thought, oh, they're some kind of fraud, you know, they're uh, uh, some, in some way a bear. I think it's the, the, the grim, humorless quality of our, of our media a lot of the time, and the universities uh, who hate a joke. You know? <laughs> Fear of being one, I guess. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> are there a lot of jokes in our language? You've um, been working on the Macquarie Dictionary for some time now. Yeah, oh, there are a lot of jokes. There's not as many as there used to be. And they've all fled my head suddenly, you know. They say, you're not going to get off that joke about uh, the university. Uh, <laughs> you're not going to show any example. But, um, no, it used to be a more humorous um, and I think civilised language a, a generation ago than it is nowadays. Uh, maybe we're coming out of that period. It was a very grim period from 1968 till now. And uh, uh, I suppose I had a fairly grim period then too. And uh, sometimes there were days that weren't, weren't really much of a joke at all in that, that period. Yeah. Are we still making, this is once again going to your work on the dictionary, are we still making words, do you think, as much as we used to? Yeah. yeah. Words? yeah. Oh, I get them from all sorts of places, overhearing sometimes. What was that word you said again, Peter? My face is festy. Festy. Festy's a great word, isn't it? <laughs> uh, she was a ranger. Well, she, redhead, you know. <laughs> and so on and on. But there are many other words, like uh, the one, one I learned just the other day in England, which was vegetarian dictator. A vegetarian dictator is one who doesn't shoot his enemies. He uh, just rusticates them, you know. He, he sends them away. Like <laughs> Apparently Mussolini was like that. He never shot anybody much. He, uh, he just gave them a... Uh, uh, a dose of castor oil and sent them into uh, yeah, exile in a village. Uh, I should say, by the way, some of these words are mentioned in one of the poems in this book, which oh, of yes, will I've be available. The, I'll read you a sample of them if you want. After the them. session. Yeah. A little sample of words that I had collected. Um, now, where exactly is that poem? Uh, that's a good word, papped. Snapped by paparazzi. Sophie Monk was, uh, was papped coming out of a, fresh, uh, a, a fast food outlet in, uh, in Hollywood. Whipping side, that's a tragic one. The right-hand side of a convict or a sheep. It's the last side of a sheep that you uh, shear and it uh, memorialises the fact that a person being flogged, tied up like that, uh, being flogged by a, by a right-handed flogger, will get, get the, right, the person mostly down the right-hand side. So uh, that, a little bit of history. Um, free traders was a 19th century expression, meaning split bloomers worn under voluminous skirts. <laughs> I love it. It came to me, that one came to me from uh, what's that, uh, Nancy Keesing. She had a splendid book of women's words called uh, Lily on the Dustbin. Window liquor, a voyeur. And my favourite Australian, uh, one of my very favourite Australian words because it's so subtle is daylight. Second place getter when winter is very superior to field. <laughs> now, Farlap come in, uh, and uh, second, second was daylight, and third was the rest of the, uh, the field. <laughs> <laughs> um, Irish town was, there used to be 20 or 30 Irish towns in Australia, and I worked out what, they, what that meant. It's where the, uh, the poor uh, manual workers who served the, uh, the early stations, cattle stations, sheep stations, uh, lived. And uh, gradually nearly all of these Irish towns changed their names and became Murrumburra Harden and uh, oh, many others. I can't just think of them all. Queenbean was one. Uh, there's only one now apparently in Tasmania. That was founded by Ulsterman who decided they liked, they were Irish and they were bloody well going to stay that way, you know, and, and kept it. Um, blackout, that's Aboriginal uh, uh, idiom for an Aboriginal party or picnic, whites not invited. Uh, a shart is defined here as a non-dry fart. Um, a limo is a limus and cattle. You might have thought you knew what a limo, lim, limo was, but no. Um, let's see what else we got. Uh, I'll finish with, uh, oh yeah, Shabaskoy, I like that one. Uh, my mother-in-law was a Shabaskoy in, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, a Gentile who does small jobs for Orthodox Jews on Sabbath and other holy days. <laughs> Lights the fire for them and that sort of thing. <laughs> but there's thousands of such words. I'm, I usually take a nosegay of about uh, 10 or 12 words to the Macquarie when I go there one day a month. I offer them to Sue Butler who's the big Dictionary's editor, she's a wonderful uh, um, lexicographer. And then I 
do whatever she what little whatever simple tasks she gives me for the rest of the day, you know. Mostly taking out words that haven't taken off, words that look promising but never really uh, got got going. The the um, um, the guiding principle of the Macquarie is usage. If it's Australian usage, uh, that's the uh, that's the determining factor of the, the dictionary. But it doesn't, doesn't mean that it's only an, only Australian words. They're all, all manner of words. The next one, one of the next words that's going to go in is yarg. Yarg is a, is a Cornish uh, cheese made, wrapped in, uh, in, in nettle leaves. <laughs> no, it's a word. It's part of the... It's part of the <laughs> Speaking of jail tats, which you were, um, I've got a friend who works in a, a jail in a medical capacity and a prisoner came in the other day and wanted a tattoo removed, he'd actually put this on his very broad forehead himself and he'd written the words, I hate life. But the problem was he did it himself and he did it in the mirror. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and all his colleagues were laughing at him, so he came into the hospital insisting they remove it in some way, which is not going to be so easy, apparently. <laughs> I think um, there was a, someone up the back there. Question? Yes, yeah, sorry, there, in the middle, please. Um, uh, someone once said that poems are like messages in bottles. They go out and you don't know who they go out to. Who would you like to think your poems are going to? A ah, very wide range of people, uh, which seems to be a little, a little bit the case. I mean, uh, people who are uh, not usually thought of as being in the culture classes uh, often um, tell me that they read a poem of mine or heard one. Occasionally you even get a poem go up on the wall somewhere. Uh, I wrote one about... Evicting a, evicting a banker uh, is in the country. It's a very hot subject in the country, or was then. Um, farm evictions were going on, you know, and foreclosures and that sort of thing. So I evicted a banker in this book. <laughs> Went up on walls all over Australia, that one. <laughs> <laughs> not city walls, not, not urban walls. I kind of hope, first of all, that those bottles will be found by country people, but I'm not uh, racist about it. I'm happy to be read by anybody. <laughs> There is someone up there before too. Yes, please. You. Ends a bit on length, I suppose, but um, uh, very often it's got a. Uh, at best, it's got a, uh, a mysterious, irrational beginning. You know, it comes to you as a kind of gift in the mind. It might be quite short, a phrase or two, and the beginnings of a, track of a train of thought that you begin to follow up into consciousness and. Uh, it gathers consciousness on around itself and it starts to have its, uh, its rhythm and all that sort of thing. Uh, because I reckon poetry is three things. It's the dreaming mind, the hindbrain, the forebrain, which is um, intellect, and uh, the, the body. The body is in it too, you know, the movement of the body. Uh, so I think any, any work of art in any uh, field at all, any kind of art form, works on that basis. It's a model of how humans really think, you know. Um, and uh, writing a novel is, well, <laughs> I, I've only written two. One's a very bad verse novel because it's over-determined and uh, oh, the characters are puppets. They get shoved around the stage. The other one's a, quite a good book because I allowed it uh, to, to tell itself. It came up, it said, uh, I'm Freddie Nep I'm, I'm Fred Freddie Bircher. I was born in um, uh, near Dungog, and uh, I had a tremendous shock, and uh, lost my sense of touch. I saw women being burned alive, and it was so terrible. I uh, lost my sense of touch for many years, and had to hide the fact, write my story, and I did from day to day. You know, uh, finding out what the story was, following it. And occasionally, you would come across a place where you think, no, it's gone false there. Pull back and find the, the real track of the story again. I told you, if you tell that story to, uh, to novelists, they, uh, they're disgusted. <laughs> because they go in for, a lot of them anyway, go in for things like plot and... Uh, and, and <laughs> I reckon any plot is a plot. You know, it's a plot again. <laughs> you don't go all postmodern on us, Les. It, uh, um, <laughs> it's a plot against somebody. <laughs> If I could just put in a personal plug for Freddie Neptune, which I think I published about a dozen years ago, but I don't think I, I currently publish it, and I'm not sure about that. But anyway, it's a wonderful book, and not enough people have read it. Have it they? It's Very still, well it's still creeping sort of. about. Them, you know. mm, no, no, it's out there, uh, and I strongly recommend it to anyone here who hasn't read it. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah. Another question, sorry. Yes, please, up the back with the two hands. 
Marks for effort. I was wondering how strongly you can connect to Aboriginal Australia. Well, you can have all the sympathy in the world, but if you don't live inside a culture, you don't know it. You know? Uh, one of my Aboriginal cousins, he said with a, a pardonable shrug of, uh, of pleasure, uh, told me that. She said, no, if you're not in it, you don't really know it. And uh, it's true. All the sympathy in the world won't take you uh, uh, inside the special knowledges and, uh, and sufferings and stuff. Uh, probably as, it's, a, it's, it's as well not to try but to be sympathetic, be as sympathetic as you can. Um, I find it... Uh, it's our only dialect, it's, uh, it's the other Australian culture, it's uh, immensely interesting in its own way, it's a complete uh, repudiation of some things we go in for. Um, and uh, it, it, it invigorates us all, I think. Um, but um, I, don't, I doubt white man can go too much further. You can start using it for polemic, which I think is like any other exploitation. <laughs> Good on you. You're not Herald Reader, are you? <laughs> um, this, uh, I've only written a few. It's one of the hardest things in the world. I think you said religious beliefs, yeah? Yeah. Um, it's one of the hardest kinds of poetry to write uh, because it's intensely private and, uh, and intensely uh, unfashionable. And... Um, but uh, it should be essayed occasionally because it is intensely uh, hard and intensely unfashionable. Um, I've written two or three halfway decent religious poems, I think. Uh, or probably you'd, you'd, you'd say doctrinal poems rather than religious poems. Religious poems are stranger and, uh, and weirder than uh, the doctrinal poems. Uh, it, but it's there under everything I write. It's, it's, it's intermixed, you know. Yeah, I think I could probably put my finger on it here and there in each particular case, but maybe not always. We've got about five minutes left. I'm thinking maybe one more question and then a last poem. What do you think? Yeah, uh, is the, is okay. That one I didn't get. Yeah, what about uh, senses? Bodily senses. Well, I wrote one about not having a sense of touch. <laughs> 10,000 line poem, I tell you, keeping the old touch out of that was a bit, uh, a bit intricate. He was able to do remarkable things, like he can sleep, um, he can sleep with, without clothes on most, most times in Australia. Uh, to save getting them crushed and, uh, and looking like a tramp, he could hang the clothes up in the tree and sleep under it naked. Uh, not to be essayed in North America and places like that, though. Um, and... Uh, Generally found that he ate a lot less because, um, uh, you know, the, the pro well, the processes of his body he gradually realised were going on without him. He says, "My, my body uh, feels things, but it just doesn't tell me." Yeah. And uh, I wanted to get that that illusion, and tried not to um, use too much touch imagery in the uh, in the things. So he wasn't giving himself away by uh, by having too much of. Uh, of the sense that he was missing. Um, but it's a case of watching yourself, you know, watching your effects. Um, I don't know how often you'd, you'd need to do that, but I guess uh, it was specifically needed there uh, for a removal of one sense, you know, um, which, of course, is a mysterious thing in the book. It's a central mysterious theme and can be, uh, you know, m means everything, you know. In it, and I'm not sure of all it's meant. This is Freddie Neptune. Freddie right, Neptune. What about yeah. one last um, shorter part? Oh my God! As in not ten thousand words. Yeah. Um, um, we have to be careful in our old age, which some people have called our anecdotage. Uh, <laughs> Not to go to go on too long, but this one goes just no. It only reaches the bottom of the page, so that would be fair. Um, I knew a fella called um, Harry Reid, and it was like this: called. Oh, and I should mention that "oi" in Spanish means uh, 
today. He worked on a newspaper in Cuba called uh, Oi. The cartoonist. Harry Reid, whom green students called Harry the Bolshe to his irritation, argued with libertarians and savagely with Hungarians and recited Spanish verbs while trolleying cadavers in the school of anatomy in a fever to reach Cuba and fight in the revolution since it had taken hold there. Harry Reid spoke of camping in hollow logs with his father, then vanished for ten years to the Bay of Pigs, to cartooning for Oi. Che and Fidel called him their kangaroo, their mascot. But when he wept home by ship up the harbour, he'd also cartooned in Toronto on the Star. The revolution was fine for getting parasites out of the bloodstream of children, but not for the mind, the life of the mind, kangaroo Harry told me. Ten more years and he lived at the Harold Park Hotel by the dog track, the harness track, the Harold Park where poor teens heard six poets for one beer. Harry wrote plays for there, one of Rudd, Steele, caricaturist, hustling a man to the gallows. And the revolution, i.e. la revolution, it was all back, Bay of Pigs and of Missiles, in its full santeria. Now he would be scattered on a park in La Havana, Harry Reid all alone, and in time it was done. He led his kindly ash bearers past an enormous field where a running man screamed threats at them because a child in their party chewed a cane stub. Yankee sabotajando el azúcar! But no, they were Australians, un veterano, sus cenizas. And Harry kept his course in the week that Fidel conceded his error in having banned the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>